Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to talk about specimen tubes in the clinical laboratory. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Alright, so we're going to be talking about the blood specimens that are collected for testing in the clinical lab today. There are a variety of colored tubes and each have different additives in them. And because of that, each one has a different purpose. One of the most critical things in the pre-analytical phase of testing is the specimen order of draw. The different colored tubes must be collected in the correct order. So phlebotomists and medical technologists absolutely need to know this. A lot of students ask me, why is this order of draw so important? And what happens if order of draw isn't done properly? The issue of drawing out of order is that it can lead to cross-contamination of the additives that are in each different tube. Ultimately, that can lead to inaccurate results for the patient. Anytime you have inaccurate results, there's a legitimate risk that the patient could be misdiagnosed. So for example, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the video, there is a tube that contains potassium and also chelates or sucks up calcium in the blood to prevent the sample from clotting. Potassium and calcium are not tests that are run on this type of tube, but if this tube's additives contaminate a tube that is used to run potassium and calcium levels, you're going to run into big problems. The potassium will be falsely increased and the calcium level will be falsely decreased. This could definitely lead to a misdiagnosis of the patient and could have some serious consequences if the physician or clinician in charge of this patient treats them based on these inaccurate results. I tell my students that we have to be advocates for the best interest of the patient, and following the order of the draw is absolutely imperative for this. So what is the order of draw? Uh, the first specimens that need to be drawn are the blood culture vials or tubes, or bottles. Most specifically, the aerobic bottle needs to be drawn before the anaerobic bottle. We will talk about the purpose of these specimens in the next slide. Uh, next is the light blue top, then red and gold tops are drawn, Green tops come next, then lavender and pink tubes, and then gray top tubes. All right, so let's talk about each of these specimen types in a little more detail. Blood culture vials or bottles are used for the detection of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria that are growing in the patient's bloodstream. This condition is called bacteremia or septicemia. These vials are sterile containers and contain anticoagulation properties to prevent the blood from clotting as well as nutrient broth to encourage that bacteria, if present, to grow. There is an aerobic and an anaerobic bottle and are most often drawn as two sets of an aerobic and anaerobic vial. Aerobic bacteria like to grow in an oxygenated environment, whereas anaerobic bacteria either don't require oxygen to grow or actually cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. So that is why we have two of these bottles, one that provides a great environment for aerobic bacteria to thrive and another for those that are anaerobic. Because the anaerobic bottle is again without oxygen, this is why the aerobic bottle must be collected first on the chance that on the initial stick, some air or oxygen will get into the bottle. So if this does happen to the aerobic bottle, it doesn't really matter, but if it happened to the anaerobic bottle, it could affect it. Uh, once drawn, these blood culture samples must be immediately taken to the laboratory and put into a blood culture analyzer. It is a large analyzer. You can see a photo of the inside of one here on this slide. And it incubates and agitates these blood culture vials for up to five days. The analyzer has a growth detecting system built into it. When bacteria grow in the bottles, they start metabolizing the nutrient broth and create carbon dioxide. A sensor in the bottle reacts with the carbon dioxide and sends a signal to the analyzer that there is growth in the bottle. And this causes the analyzer to alarm. When it alarms, the technologist takes out the vial to start the workup of the bacteria to identify uh, the species of bacteria and its susceptibilities to antibiotics. So after any blood cultures are drawn, next come the light blue top tubes. These contain sodium citrate that act as an anticoagulant, which prevents the blood in this tube from clotting. Light, blo light blue tops are used for coagulation tests in the laboratory. So this is your protime INR, PTTs, fibrinogen, D-dimers, anti-10As if they have them, and thromboelastograph or uh, TEG studies if uh, the laboratory acts, uh, it does those. Um, they, these are also used for any other specific clotting factor assays. 
The blood in this specimen should not clot, and if a clot is present, it must be redrawn. In a broad description, these coagulation tests determine when a clot is formed and then produce a result from that. So if the specimen in the tube is already clotted, you're going to get an inaccurate result. There is a critically, critically important piece of information on light blue taps, the etched fill line, as you can see in this arrowed picture. There is a, this is a minimum fill line. This is not, I repeat, this is not a suggestion. These tubes must be filled to the etched line or they need to be rejected for redraw. This tube contains a very specific anticoagulation ratio. It is nine parts blood to one part sodium citrate. If the blood is not fully filled to that line, this is messing up that anticoagulation ratio and will absolutely give you inaccurate results. <laughs> I have found working in the lab that there seems to be a disparity between the laboratory staff and nursing about the importance of this tube being properly filled. I've been asked countless times when requesting a light blue top specimen to be redrawn when it is not filled properly if I can just quote unquote run it anyway. <laughs> Actually, as a matter of fact, um, I've had nurses from doctor's office write, uh, we know it isn't filled properly, we couldn't get a good stick, run it no matter what. Uh, legit, that's happened. <laughs> uh, I understand that sometimes patients can be a difficult stick. I get that. I get it. But that is basically asking a laboratory professional to run a test uh, knowing full well that the result is inaccurate. Uh, that This uh, ultimately disadvantages the patient and can potentially cause a lot of harm if the phys a physician uses these results and thinks that they are accurate. Again, as I tell my students, you need to be an advocate for the patient. Be a patient warrior. Do what is right. Don't report out wrong results and don't run coagulation tests on underfill blue taps. Next, we have the red, gold, and like red, black speckled top tubes. This uh, one on the left here is a red top. This specific one is made of glass and has no additives in it. The gold top on the right is often called an SST or a serum separator tube. If you see on this gold top in this presentation, at the bottom there is like a little bit of gel there. This is what separates the serum and the blood. In the next slide, you'll be able to see a better example of what, it, what this looks like when the tube is centrifuged. So the gold top tube here on the right has a clot activator. It mixes with the patient's blood and must clot before it is centrifuged. It is used for chemistry testing and produces something called serum, which is the liquid portion of the blood that is left over after it clots. On this slide is a red black speckled top tube that contains a serum separated gel like I just talked about in, the, in the, the previous slide. You can see clearly in this picture how this gel barrier works. So the blood is collected, it's let to clot, then it's spun in the centrifuge and this is what it looks like after spinning. The serum is on top here as you can see from the first uh, little arrow. In the middle is a gel barrier and on the bottom are the red blood cells. This gel provides a barrier In chemistry we're only testing this top part. Uh, the serum in this case, and this gel is super helpful in keeping the serum and the red cells apart. Uh, I also want to note here that I found this picture as a free resource online because it showed two very great examples. One, a great example of a spun down tube showing a gel barrier, and also a great example of what not to do. Um, this is a glaringly obvious uh, thing not to do in the lab. Never, ever, ever touch or handle blood specimen without a pair of gloves on. Uh, this person in this photo gets a big F for lab safety. Keep safe, wear gloves. The next tube in the order of draw is a green top. These are often called plasma separator tubes or PSTs. The main difference between the PST and the SST is that this one has plasma. Plasma is like serum but has clotting agents like fibrinogen still in it. This tube contains heparin, which prevents the blood from clotting, so it does not need to clot before it is spun down. A lot of clinical chemistry tests are run on PSTs. They help with a quicker turnaround time from draw to result because we don't have to wait for them to clot, and we can just immediately spin them down when we receive them in the lab. One thing to note is that some tests like ammonia, ionized calciums, lactic acid, they get drawn on green tops and they do require the specimen to be put on ice to help maintain the stability of the sample. Also important to note on that is on ice does not mean in ice. Um, a lot of phlebotomists and nurses um, don't understand that you don't actually have to submerge the tube in the ice. You can just put it on top of the ice. That works fine. <laughs> the next tube in the order of draw are the lavender and the pink tap tubes. 
These contain something called potassium EDTA, and it's sprayed on the inside of these tubes. EDTA acts as something called a chelating agent. When it comes in contact with the blood being collected into the tube, it sucks up the calcium in that blood. It chelates the calcium. Um, it, you will learn in your hemostasis and coagulation course that calcium is part of something called the coagulation cascade, meaning it is needed for your body's blood to form a clot. So this EDTA sucks up all that calcium and it prevents the blood in the lavender and pink top tube from clotting. The lavender top is used for hematology specimens such as complete blood counts, CBCs, uh, sedimentation rates, and also for something called a glycated hemoglobin or an A1C. Pink tops are used primarily in blood banking specimens. Um, the, the main thing to note about uh, this is that if the specimen is properly mixed at collection, it should not clot. Any clot in, in this specimen needs to be redrawn. So for hematology specimens, we're assessing the number of white cells, uh, the number of red blood cells, the platelets, etc. And if it's clotted, all those things that we're counting are all clotted up in that clot, and we're un unable to get an accurate count. So for these, any clot equals rejection of that specimen. Um, like we discussed previously, uh, the lavender tube is a good lesson as to why order of draw is crucial to follow. Um, so if a lavender tube is drawn before a chemistry tube, the potassium EDTA may contain, uh, contaminate the tube that, uh, and cause wonky results. Um, again, I talked about this earlier in the presentation. Uh, this could be disastrous for the patient, so we need to make sure that the order of draw is followed every single time. The last tube in the order of draw is the gray top tube. This contains either potassium oxalate or sodium fluoride. This inhibits glycolysis, so it can be used in a situation where there isn't a centrifuge immediately available and the patient needs a glucose test ordered. Um, so glucose is rapidly used by the red blood cells if it's left to sit. And so um, if specimens are left to sit without centrifuging and they need a glucose result uh, and, and we uh, spin them down and run them you know, hours later, which is unacceptable, that glucose is going to be falsely decreased. So you can use a gray top tube and it inhibits the breakdown of glucose. Um, so this potentially could be like maybe in a nursing home or a home health visit where the, the nurse or the patient care technician is drawing the, the sample um, at the patient's home or at the nursing home and then sending us uh, the sample a little while later in the lab. Um, this tube is also used for uh, certain clinical chemistry tests, uh, most often lactic acids, which must be on ice. Again, on ice, not in ice. <laughs> and so this uh, concludes the video on specimen tubes in the laboratory. If you have any questions, feel free to comment in the section below. I will make every attempt to respond to your questions about this presentation. Um, and also, please leave a comment if you have a suggestion or a particular laboratory topic that you would like me to do a video lecture on. I can try to help that out if, if needed.